we stopped the last time at verse 52 of chapter 3 and we are now beginning the last group of verses in chapter 3 and these are about liberation. These are very important verses, especially verse 53, which says, Knowledge of Viveka comes from Samyama on the moment and its succession. First of all, we should understand what Viveka means. Viveka is awareness of the distinction between self and non-self. Viveka is essentially discriminative enlightenment, as some people call it. And if we were to use our diagram, we would see very clearly that what is the distinction between the self and the non-self? We see this is the self and everything else is the non-self. And when this dis distinction is clear with full awareness, this is Viveka. Now you know it. But that is not Viveka. Understanding this at an intellectual level is not Viveka. Viveka is the direct experience of this and when it's established. So this means that the person is a witness. He's witnessing everything in the world around him. He witnesses everything that's happening at a physical level and at the level of conscious as well as unconscious mind. This is an amazing state. The average person cannot relate to this at all. Very often we speak in meditation of witnessing thoughts. In reality, uh, that is not a very correct line because most of us do not know how to witness our thoughts. We may observe them a bit, but that's not quite the same as this state of witnessing. So I hope that was clarified. That is Viveka, discriminative enlightenment, and it's the knowledge from that comes from Samyama on the moment. Samyama was described as the absorption or the deep concentration. Deep concentration on the moment, the present, the now. What does that mean? That means being in the present moment, living in it fully, completely, complete awareness. If you sit back, look around you, experience the space around you, then just for a second or so, you might be able to be in the moment. But all of us know that it's very hard to be in the moment because it takes a lot of effort to do that. The moment you try to be in the moment for a while, you, you succeed for a couple of seconds and then immediately a thought comes in. There's some thought, there's a feeling, there's a distraction, you notice something. So it's almost impossible to be in the moment just by trying. So here we are talking about a state where it is effortless. It just happens. And it happens because some work has been done. There has been a purification of the samskaras that are in the active and latent unconscious mind. Once these samskaras have lost their power, they've been attenuated initially and then eventually burnt in the fire of awareness or knowledge, then this is established, a state of the witness, Viveka. 
And such a person is in the moment, living in the moment and its succession. What does that mean? The moment after that also you're in the moment. The moment succeeding that, you're also living in the present. So you're living in the present all the time. There are some intellectuals, sometimes we call them neo-advertites. They follow a concept called neo-advaita where they say we are already enlightened and we're living in the present, we're meditating all the time. Because we already are, there's nothing to do. You know, it's a nice theory, it's a nice idea, but it is not being lived up in practice. Because if that were the case, then there are many people who are apparently enlightened. And uh, I'm not too sure about that. So this is the state of Viveka and living in the present. Any questions about this? About the idea of living in the present? Living in the present has been really, you know, used very much uh, also in Buddhist teachings, mindfulness, these ideas of living in the present. While these may be good practices for stress reduction or to help maybe focus the mind a little, this is not uh, quite living in the present as described here by the Yoga Sutras. Verse 54. From Viveka comes knowledge of distinction between similars, which cannot be distinguished by class, characteristic, or position. A couple of different things here that need to be explained. How do you know any object? You know it by its class. For example, you know whether it's an inanimate object or an animate person. If it's animate, you say, is it a plant? Is it an animal? Is it a human? So these, this means this is a class. And you can distinguish between a human being and an animal. Right? So that is what class is about. Characteristic is, there is characteristics of any object. For example, we can take a table. Is it made out of wood? Is it made out of metal? Is it made out of plastic? Or you can ask, is it light in color? Is it dark in color? This way you can distinguish between different tables. What is position? Similarly, if you take the object to be chairs, there are many similar looking chairs around a table. How do you distinguish between these chairs? They look all the same. You distinguish between them through their position. You might say, oh, the chair at the head of the table or the chair at the left hand side of the table or on the right hand side of the table. And so you can distinguish between the chairs. But what happens when there is something so similar that you cannot distinguish by class, characteristic, or position? We take coins. Take the same coin and the two, three similar coins. They're exactly the same coins. How do you distinguish between them? You can imagine, therefore, it gets a little bit more difficult to tell them apart. But with Viveka, with this discriminative enlightenment, comes the knowledge of distinction between similars, between that which cannot normally be distinguished. This is really difficult to understand because a witness, a person who has this level of knowledge or experience, 
has access to infinite knowledge and intuition and sees subtleties that the average person does not see. I have used the example of mother and child before, where I said that the child is stealing sweets from the kitchen, climbs up on the table and tries to get the sweets and the mother sees the child from outside, but the child cannot see the mother. And little children don't have that kind of awareness. And the mother sees perhaps the child through a mirror or reflection in the window and says, aha, I can see you. And the child wonders, how did mother see me? How does mother know? That is due to a lack of awareness on the child's part. The child grows up and his awareness mm -hmm. expands. His field of awareness expands and the mother cannot fool the child anymore. Earlier she could say, yes, all mothers have these powers. They can even see through walls. But no longer, when the child is a little older, the child also has that expanded awareness. Now, a witness who has Viveka has expanded his awareness to maximum. It cannot be expanded any further. And with such consciousness, the power of discerning becomes also infinite and can distinguish between things that even are very similar. Any questions or comments on this verse? 3.554. Okay, and we continue. Verse 55, it's a lovely verse. This transcendental knowledge called Tarak comprehends all things at all times going beyond the sequential process. I think I did mention in one of these last meetings when we talked about Tarak that last year we visited a shrine with the mentoring program called Tarkeshwar and that is the shrine of Lord Shiva in his form of Tarak, Lord, Lord of intuitive knowledge, Lord of transcendental knowledge. And uh, it's a very beautiful experience. So Tarak means intuition or transcendental knowledge. It is that knowledge that goes beyond logic, beyond reason. It's not sequential, it's not analytical. And the knowledge that comes to you in this form, Tarak, is presented to you at one time. It's like a data package or a massive download all instantly. It doesn't take time. There's no sequence. For example, we are studying the Yoga Sutras. We're going through the sequence. We are going through the Yoga Sutras one verse at a time. That's sequential. If you study anything, you take up any subject, you always go through a certain sequence. If you want to study well, you want to go deeper into the subject matter. Tarak doesn't need sequence. It's just knowing and seeing. It's not intellectual knowledge nor understanding. It is this infinite knowledge or wisdom and such a person has complete access to this knowledge. And we can understand this a little bit better if we go back to our diagram and see that the person who is a witness is right here at the level of 
center of consciousness and he's witnessing everything from here. So we know that center of consciousness is in me, it's also in you. All of us have a center of consciousness. This center of consciousness is the same in me as it is in you. The drop of the ocean has the same quality as the ocean itself. So if this drop is in me and in you, that part is connected and through this we are connected to everybody and everything. We are one. And because of this connection, we have access to all knowledge. We are also connected to all beings, not just human beings, but all beings. Think of it as a laptop or a mobile device, any device that has an internet connection. It's all connected to some servers and through these connections, we are all connected. And it's a similar concept, just a little bit more sophisticated, of course. So we understand how, through this connection, we plug into this universal consciousness, this energy, which is infinite. And this cannot be explained through logic or analysis. It comes from within, it is not external, and it is definitely not based on knowledge from the senses. The senses acquire knowledge of all the objects in the external world. But this knowledge comes from deep within, and it is all comprehensive. This kind of intuition or knowledge is also not quite the same thing as instinct. Very often people mix instinct and intuition, mix it up and confuse the two. Instinct is actually more animal-like and is based more on fear. So instinctively you will keep away from danger, from fire. You will instinctively keep away from dangerous creatures like poisonous snakes. That's not intuition. Intuition is far deeper. Any questions about that? Okay. Then verse 56, when equality is established between buddhisattva and purusha in their purity, liberation takes place. Now this is something that we need to understand a little bit more in detail. Buddhi is part of the mind. Purusha is the same thing as pure consciousness. So let's go to our diagram to understand that. Okay, so now we have our diagram and we know that the conscious mind, this is aware. Right now you are listening to me, you're watching the screen and you are aware, you're conscious. In the unconscious mind there is stuff happening but you're not very conscious of it because you are paying attention to what I'm saying, hopefully. When through a process of dhyana, deep meditation, you become aware of the active unconscious mind. The conscious mind is expanded. What has happened is that what was previously hidden 
in the act of unconscious has now become conscious. Similarly, you further expand through deeper meditation and you may find that you had suppressed emotions here in the latent unconscious. Bottled up emotions, anger, disappointment, frustration, jealousy, greed, all these things suppressed here, bottled up. And as you become aware of that, you have expanded your consciousness here, your conscious mind, as well as at the same time, these samskaras here in the active and latent unconscious are being burnt. They have no more power. The moment there is the light of consciousness or the light of awareness falls on it, they lose their power. It's because we suppress these negative emotions and are not able to observe them in a kind of neutral manner without being affected or disturbed by them. Therefore, they remain in the latent unconscious mind and disturb us in different ways, such as in disease. But as we keep expanding our consciousness, what happens is there is no more unconscious mind. It's gone. The entire mind has now become conscious. This is the fire of Kundalini, enlightenment, moksha, kevalya, different names. So earlier you saw that this waking state here was very limited and very small. But now it has expanded to include the whole mind. And basically, you are at the same time also fully aware of the world around you. So you're basically fully conscious. And what has happened now, therefore, you are established here. So in a sense, you see that the conscious mind and the center of consciousness have now become one and the same. They're equal. Complete awareness. I hope it makes some sense. So that was verse 56, and that was the very last verse in chapter 3. I'm sure that chapter 3 was a bit challenging, perhaps a little bit difficult to understand, but I hope all the same that you all got some insights into the process leading towards higher consciousness and eventually to total liberation. Come to chapter 4, Kaivalyapada, a chapter on liberation. It's a very interesting chapter. There are some fascinating little verses and then there are also verses that are extremely esoteric, very difficult to follow. So verse 1 of chapter 4. The Siddhis are a result of birth, medicinal herbs, mantra, austerities and samadhi. So all the super normal powers that we talked about in chapter 3, they can be the result of birth, medicinal herbs, mantra, austerities of samadhi. So we can go through each of these. Birth. Why birth? As you keep evolving in births, you know, you may have, <clears throat> all of us have started 
somewhere. And it is said that we go through an entire evolution which goes through millions of lifetimes to even get a human body. So you have been in different lives, plants, trees, animals, etc. And <clears throat> finally you have evolved and got a human body. Now, imagine you have evolved to an extent that you have really let go a lot of the glaciers have been burned and you have attained some glimpses into higher levels of consciousness in a previous birth. Then in this birth, you may already have acquired some siddhis. They come naturally. We know that some people have some certain psychic abilities and well, some of them may be fraud. Some of them are also apparently genuine. And so we say that this comes from having acquired them in previous births. Similarly, there are also cases of great sages and saints who at a very young age attained very high levels of consciousness or liberation. This too is a result of birth. They have had the privilege of going through this in previous lifetimes. So the good news is that all of us will continue to evolve irrespective of what happens. Those who take up this path, practice, meditation, some sort, sort of discipline, they do so because they want to accelerate the process, speeden up the process of evolution. And that is possible. So some of the means for speedening up this process are medicinal herbs, mantra austerities, and of course, samadhi. How can medicinal herbs help? Here we are not talking about some sort of drugs from the pharmacy. We're talking about ancient practices called aushadi in Ayurveda. And these are different preparations, mostly not mostly, almost always plant-based, but some also mineral-based, and um, so organic as well as inorganic. And these are used to purify the body as well as the mind. Most of us have heard about Ayurvedic treatments where people go through purification process, different uh, massages and and diets and stuff which purify the body. Very few people are aware that earlier times these Ayurvedic vides also had the knowledge of deeper practices using herbs which also purified the mind. This knowledge has been partly lost during the colonial time when the British brought along their own doctors and ridiculed the Indian system of medicine, which was also deeply connected to Tantra. And uh, <clears throat> partly because of environmental reasons, many of these herbs were destroyed, uh, have been, you know, um, do not exist anymore. Some is because of the broken lineage uh, of Ayurvedic physicians who no longer were able to hand down their practical aspect of their science. So modern doctors, Ayurvedic doctors read scriptures but sometimes do not understand them or do not interpret them correctly. So for various reasons, part of this knowledge is lost. There are definitely people who still practice these in very remote parts of India. But most Ayurvedic practitioners, especially those who go to modern Ayurvedic colleges, do not have this 
deeper knowledge of Ayurvedic herbs, which is connected to the fourth Veda, which is called the Athar Veda. Our tradition is connected to the Athar Veda, and that's why also the Upanishads, which I we had meetings on, that is the Mandukya and Mundak, are from the Athar Veda. So, there are certain advantages and disadvantages of using such medicinal herbs to purify the mind. One is that there's a dependency on the therapist. Second is that you're limited also by the knowledge of the therapist. There may be side effects of these herbs if they're not correctly used. Some of you may be aware that in India, the yogis or sannyasis wandering on the streets of India, they also use things like charas, ganja. These are forms of marijuana and, um, yeah, and other substances that are not very strong. But all the same, these can be addictive. And some people also abuse these substances then. So there are advantages and disadvantages to use of medicinal herbs. Then comes mantra. So mantra can also be used to attain. And here... But mantra, the use of different mantras from books, videos, etc. is definitely not recommended. If you get a mantra, it should be prescribed, initiated by a teacher of a meditative tradition, of a mantra tradition. And a lot depends on the method and the teacher-student relationship. There are many factors which determine if the mantra will be useful. If the mantra, so to say, falls on unprepared ground, then that mantra will not really be very effective. Mantra is like a seed. That's why many of these mantras are known as Vija mantra, which means seeds. So if these seeds fall on ground that's not prepared, they will not germinate. They will be ineffective. So in best case, it's just a waste of time. Which is why a good teacher always prepares the student. Preparation includes lifestyle, discipline, different aspects, developing relationship with the teacher. All this is a part of mantra meditation. There are different mantras, some which are commonly used and known. Soham, for example. Om, one says that is used only by sannyasis or monks. It's not entirely true. It is used also in our tradition, but there's a special way to use it. This has been described in my book, Master Venkanayam. So if you want to learn how to use Om, you can refer to the book. For example, Gayatri Mantra is another mantra which is commonly recited in temples, but the way of using it as a mantra must be learned from a teacher of a meditative mantra tradition. Next is austerities or tapas. This is discipline, discipline in lifestyle, discipline. Various practices could include, for example, having less food, you know, maybe a bit of fasting, or daily practice, or having a disciplined life, waking up at regular times, sleeping at regular times. All of these are also very important. While these may all be useful, the highest method of attainment is Samadhi. So 
the direct experience will transform your life dramatically. Medicinal herbs too and mantra too can do that, but it's not quite the same as samadhi. Samadhi is very earth-shaking experience and that can really uh, take the person to the next level of consciousness, which is exactly what verse 2 is about, the next level of consciousness. Any questions about verse 1? Perhaps there are some questions there because it's referring also to herbs, mantra, austerity, samadhi. Everybody seems to be happy. That's nice. So we go to verse 2 of Kevalyapada. I find this to be a very fascinating verse. This and the, the one following, that's verse 3. Referring to birth transformation from one species or kind to another takes place due to the overflow of natural potentials. When we talk about overflow, it means certain something has reached its capacity and it's not possible anymore. If you have a consciousness, imagine the consciousness of an animal. Let's take a dog, cat. And you can imagine that that kind of consciousness you know, is, is very limited. But when this being has gone through many births, at some point of time, this consciousness moves to a next level. And then this being needs another body to be able to express this higher consciousness. So, in other words, when you have lived out your dog samskaras or your cat samskaras, you move to a higher level of consciousness, then you need a different kind of body to express those, that kind of consciousness. We can understand this a little bit better when I say, Gold, for example, can be turned into earrings or into rings or necklaces. There is no real change other than the form. So you can be one cat, a black cat, or a, or a white cat, or a brown cat. It doesn't matter. It's, you, you don't need a different kind of body because your consciousness is the same. But when there's a fundamental change in the nature, for example, when hydrogen changes to helium. You know, we're talking about a com complete fundamental change of nature. And similar process, when you have lived out certain samskaras and you move to the next level, then you need a different body to express that consciousness. So generally, the movement of this evolution is always upwards, towards higher consciousness. So you would move from plant to animal to human. Even within human, we would move to, to more sophisticated uh, forms, that is, from a tamasic birth to a rajasic and eventually a sattvic person. And while we like to think to be politically correct and say everybody's the same. In the yogic literature, there are tamasic people, rajasic people, sattvic people, and most of us are mixed, mixed consciousness, a little bit of tamas, a little bit of rajas, a little bit of sattva. So it's about purifying and becoming more sattvic. 
So transformation from one species to another takes place when you have that capacity has been reached and you move to another kind of body in order to express the samskaras. I assume there are no questions. Then we'll continue to verse 3. Verse 3 is also extremely interesting and a very practical verse in a sense. It is not the cause, like a virtuous act, that leads to overflow of natural potentials. Rather, the removal of obstacles, like a farmer removing barriers to let the water flow into his fields. So how do you move to the next level of consciousness? Why well, we are all human beings and we still can move to higher levels of consciousness in terms of our spiritual development. So how do you get to that point of this overflow of natural potential? Well, you will not succeed by just doing good deeds. So it's not the cause like a good virtuous act. It's good. You know, good deeds are, are very nice. Definitely one should continue to, to be virtuous. But for a fundamental change into a higher level of consciousness, you have to remove the obstacles. The example given is of a farmer. In India, it is seen that farmers irrigate their lands, their fields, through canals. And many of these canals are just makeshift made by the farmers themselves and when they do not want the water to flow, they build a little mud dam. It's a very small little thing. It's very small and when they want the water to flow, they take a shovel or a spade and then they just break down that dam. It's just made of earth. So the water starts flowing. So when the energy is flowing, prana is flowing through the body, without any blocks, you have removed some obstacles through meditation. What kind of obstacles? Mostly this is about kleshas. When you start removing the kleshas itself, then the Consciousness starts flowing, the prana starts flowing, different pranic channels. So basically you have to remove the negative and harmful thoughts, negative, harmful emotional patterns that block the flow of energy. It would be the equivalent of saying you have poor health and uh, because you're eating wrong food, but instead of changing your food habits, you just pop some pills. What you need to do is you need to stop eating the, the wrong food. That's the obstacle. So remove the obstacle and you will be healthy. Just remove the bad food, eat good food, and you're going to be healthy again. So this is what this verse means. That it's not just enough to do virtuous acts. What you need to do is a deeper transformation by attenuating glaciers, burning up glaciers, removing these negative and harmful thought patterns, emotional patterns, behavior patterns. And this will lead us to a higher level of consciousness where you're, you have more trust, you feel connected, you're plugged into this wonderful um, energy, this universal self, and this infinite knowledge, intuition, tarak.
So verses 4 to 6 are about mastery of our mind. A word of caution here. This may be a little bit difficult to follow, a little bit incredible. But remember that the one who has attained state of witness is not like a normal person anymore. He is... We cannot relate to this person. So verse 4 says, All constructed minds are created purely from the sense of individuality. So before I explain the verse to you, let me give you a little background. Your mind, my mind and everybody's mind is made up of thinking patterns, emotional patterns. We think in certain ways. If you are faced with danger, you panic or you get really scared. If, if somebody insults you, you get angry. These are certain patterns. And these patterns are nothing other than our identities and it is called asmita or egoism. In a sense, it's not good nor bad. It is merely an identity and there are many of these. <clears throat> some of them are useful, some are not useful. You have an identity perhaps of being mother as well as daughter, maybe sister as well as wife. Same for men, the other way around for men. And some of these identities, you, your behavior changes according to the person you're with. But most of the time, we're doing this unconsciously. Now imagine that the yogi, the master, creates identities, but consciously for a specific purpose. And then the purpose is achieved, he can dissolve that asmita, that identity. What we want to achieve through meditation is also to dissolve identities. But... It may be useful for a yogi who has some samskaras to live out. He's a witness, he's witnessing, but he still has samskaras. They've not all burnt away. He's a jivan moth, he's not, he's not fully liberated. Then those samskaras need a vehicle to be lived out. So a yogi can create a mind, identities, to live out that, those particular samskaras. And such a mind is a constructed mind. And it is created purely from asmita, or sense of individuality. Now, while it doesn't say so in the Yoga Sutras, it does say so in the Vyas Bhasya, that this also leads to the construction of bodies, nirmankaya, that means a constructed body, not just nirman chitta, which is a constructed mind, but in the commentary it refers to a constructed body. So, those of you who have read Autobiography of Yogi, you may recall that the master of Swami Yoganand was able to create a body. And uh, this verse is referring to this superpower, supernormal power, called Nirman Kaya and Nirman Chitta. So it's a matter of belief, it's pretty incredible that they can create another body just in order to live out some samskaras. <clears throat> verse 5 
Verse 5 says, one principal mind directs the many constructed minds in different activities. So now if you have all these different asmitas or identities that have been created, well, there has to be somebody who's coordinating them. And that's the principal mind. So the principal mind is the one that created all these and directs them. Without such a principal mind, this would not make any sense because there would be nobody to direct these constructed minds because they have been actually constructed for a purpose to live out certain samskaras. So the principal mind is the true mind, so to say, of the yogi. And the others are purely constructs, which are a bit like a magician, you know, they, they create it. So of, of these, the mind born of meditation is free from samskaras. Now the principal mind has no samskaras. Most of these are brand. It's mostly a witness. And maybe it's creating these minds also partly or bodies in order to serve. These are arhats. They come back to help others to be liberated. Any questions regarding this? I know it's an incredible idea being able to create minds, create bodies. Okay, then we go to the next group of verses, karma, samskaras, and vasanas. We will not be able to complete this entire group of verses, but we can begin with verse 7. Once again, this is an important verse if you are really meditating, if you're really practicing, and if you really aspire to be free of suffering. The actions of a yogin are not white, not black, whereas the actions of others are of three kinds. So through meditation, through samadhi, yogi becomes a witness. When you see things as they are, without the filter of the mind, there are no glaciers, that kind of action creates no result. There's no more karma generated. And such action is called not white, not black. So for most of us, what happens is if you were bitten once by a dog, you're always going to be afraid of dogs. The moment you see a dog, however cute it may be, somewhere in you is lurking the fear that it might bite, might snap. So you have got some klesha in there. And so your actions will be determined by that klesha. The other three kinds of samskaras are these three other kinds of karma manifest according to potential desires, vasanas. So first we must understand what are the other three kinds of karma. So there's white, black, and black and white. White karma, as it kind of indicates, are good deeds, good actions good thoughts. And most of us have been raised perhaps in religious way 
have been told always be a good person, do good things, and and you try to do that. You try to help others. This, this is all very good. Black are evil deeds, evil thoughts, evil actions. So most of us are also doing some evil actions. We may not consider ourselves evil, but we do have thoughts of jealousy, greed, anger, hate. And sometimes we do small little nasty things. They're not very nasty, but they're small things like you may ignore somebody you don't like. Somebody asks you to help them and you don't really like that person. Then you, you probably just say, yeah, sure, I will, but you never get back. To that person. So these are black karma. Black and white is mixed. So you do something good, but maybe the motive is not right. So you help somebody, but you do it because you want something in return. So these are the three kinds of karma. Karma of yogi through samadhi and then by living that in his life is not white, not black. It is witnessing, it's being fully aware. Everybody else has three kinds of karma. What happens then with this karma is that there's a desire, vasanas or desires, and you need to live that out. So you perform some actions. And that will fuel more desire. And so you have a vicious cycle. The idea then is you somehow need to break that vicious cycle to get out of this level of consciousness, to go to the next level, you somehow have to break that vicious circle and best form is to acquire not white, not black karma or some scars. This is probably a good place to stop. If there are any questions, I can take them now. I think everybody is very happy. I'm quite aware that in our last few sessions, nobody has been asking questions and I quite understand the topic is difficult. And um, ah, there's a question from Lucia and Raphael. Yes, please go ahead. You can also speak, you know, you can unmute yourself and speak. Okay, so. <clears throat> I have unmuted myself for the question. It is not a very glorious or important question anyway. I hope uh, you won't mind, Radhika. No, not at all. Uh, uh, I, I also sent you a message with this question. The, the translation and interpretation you offer is so wonderful. Yeah. It's so clear that uh, we are wondering, uh, is it published? Is, is it available somewhere in, in text? Form? Are you referring to the document that I'm using right now? Uh, yes. Yes. Well, that's not ready yet. Um, I'm working on the translation for my book. It's called The Book of Enlightenment, and it's a commentary on the Yoga Sutras. So it's not complete yet. But on the website, there is another translation that's called the, I think it's called Easy Reading Yoga Sutras, which has got only uh, chapter one and two. And that is available on the website. You can download that. Um, and that's also really very nice because these are the two more practical chapters. 
while chapter three and four are a little bit more esoteric. So if you like, for the time being, you can download that. It's under the, it's on the homepage under free downloads. And um, for this particular document, you'll have to wait a little bit longer. That's wonderful. And, and you have also uploaded the videos for all these uh, classes to yes. your YouTube channel, right? Yes, yes. You will also find the lectures on the Essential Yoga Sutras. I think there are only five uh, lectures there. So you can also have a look at that if you want. Wonderful, Radhika. So thank you very much. And namaste. Namaste. So thank you, everybody, for being there. And we uh, will see you again on Friday next week. Bye-bye. Bye, Barry. Glad you like it. Bye, Nita. Bye, everyone. Tabi Jan. Bye, Radhika. Bye, Radhika. I'm trying to turn this off. Bye. Bye. Thank you.